have your Bibles, open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you didn't bring one, um, there's a Bible scattered, Bible scattered in the pews in front of you. Um, many of you have it on your, on your phone, on your app. You might have a Bible app on your phone or on your iPad. Whatever you have, uh, we would encourage you to uh, turn to it. Also, if you want to, you can go to our Hollywood Community Church app. You can download that, and the outline for today's message is there as well, trying to give you as much as we can for your convenience today. Well, in my mind, I'm not sure whether you agree with me, but in my mind, one of the most intriguing stories is about someone who died and was brought back to life. Most of us have probably stood beside the casket of a loved one, or maybe beside the grave of a loved one, and wished that we could speak with that loved one again. Whether it's mom or dad or son or a daughter or a grandma or a grandpa, there, there's something about wanting someone who has passed away to come back to life. ABC recently tried to capture that emotion with a show that they named Resurrection. I'm not sure whether anybody watched the program Resurrection. It was about people who had died who mysteriously came back to life. Uh, you must not have watched it. I didn't either because they canceled it after a season. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how popular the show is. The, the reality, though, is that there are very few people who have died and have come back to life. That is a very exclusive club. I can tell you that there would not be a more powerful story than to listen to someone who was dead but now is alive. I think of all the characters in the Bible that I would love to sit down and have a conversation with. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with Lazarus and just say, okay, tell me what it was like to be in the grave for three days. And then all of a sudden when you walked out of that grave and you had those grave clothes on, what was going through your mind? Did you understand? Wouldn't that be a cool conversation to talk with someone who had been dead and now has come back to life? Well, this morning, whether you realize it or not, this morning, this auditorium is filled with people who were brought back from the dead. Now, don't look at your neighbor as if they're a zombie. I don't want you to think that, oh my word, where in the world have I gotten myself into and what in the world is going on here? But it's true. Look around you. You were surrounded by people this morning who have passed from death to life. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. And then Jesus makes this statement. He says, he will never come into judgment. Catch this. This is our theme this weekend. Because he has passed from death to life. So this morning, this morning in this service, we're talking about what it means to pass from death to life. Now, you know as well as I do that Jesus is not speaking of physical death at that moment. At that moment, he's speaking of spiritual death, and as a result, he is speaking of spiritual life. And Jesus says, and the Apostle Paul reiterates later two times in Colossians and also Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says that every single person is born spiritually dead. Now, I know that might sound like a paradox. You say, Brian, what do you mean? They're born alive, but they're dead. That's exactly right. They're born physically alive, but they are born spiritually dead. Paul says that all of us, we're in, we're dead in our trespasses and in our sins. You sit back as we asked on Friday and said, well, Brian, what do I need to do then? Quite honestly, there's nothing that you can do. There is only one person that can infuse life into something that is dead, and that is Jesus Christ. 
So the question this morning is this. Are you spiritually alive or are you spiritually dead? Because of Jesus, have you taken that step from the world of the dead to the world of the living? That's what Paul talks about in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you, if you grab your Bible, 1 Corinthians is toward the end of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says this in verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. We'll kind of flesh that word out in just a second. Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast the word I preach to you, unless, Paul says, of course, you believed in vain. Verse three, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Catch this, if you underline in your Bible, if you highlight on your phone, this is a great phrase, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the nutshell of the message today. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much for everything we've been able to see and hear and experience. Lord, I, I, I get pumped. You know my heart. I get pumped to see so many people here on Easter Sunday as we come to celebrate our day of victory, as we come to celebrate your resurrection. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us for just a few moments to calm our minds, to calm our hearts, help us to put our spiritual thinking caps on, help us to be honest with ourselves as we examine ourselves in the light of your word. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to do an inventory. Am I spiritually dead or am I spiritually alive? Am I living with hope or am I living hopeless? And Lord, as we look at the truth, the reality of the resurrection, help us to understand that this morning. Maybe understand it in a way that we've never understood it this morning before. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would do what I can't do, what none of us can do. I pray that he'd bring clarity and conviction to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me give you just a little bit of background information of this chapter. We are, by the way, in the middle of a series called Scandalous Church, and we're walking through this letter, 1 Corinthians, and we're kind of jumping. Right now, I think we're in chapter 6, and today we're jumping ahead to chapter 15 just to be able to deal with this topic of the resurrection. But just a couple of things. This is in your outline, which is on the back of your bulletin. But in this chapter, Paul presents one of the great apologetic arguments in the New Testament, apologetic being that the apostle Paul brings one of the greatest defenses as to the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus that is found anywhere in the New Testament. If you, if you um, love a legal argument, if you love a legal drama, if you have a lawyer's mind, then you'll understand what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this chapter because he brings an excellent defense of our faith. But this chapter not only deals with the theological. This chapter also deals with the practical. Because if it was just a, a theological knowledge that we receive, we walk away saying, okay, I get it. I get all the Bible terms. I understand it. That wouldn't help you and I where we live today. And, and, and this morning I realized that all of us are here today and we came with our lives, with our problems, with our blessings, with our burdens. We came today, all of that baggage with us. And if you're like me, I want to know this morning, how does the resurrection help me today? How does the resurrection help me when I wake up tomorrow morning, Brian, and I don't want to go to work? And how does it help me when I pull out of my driveway and that neighbor just aggravates the living daylights out of me and I have to respond to that neighbor? How does it help me be a better husband or a mom or, or uh, a dad? How does the resurrection help me? Well, we see that in this chapter because it's not just theological. It's practical as well. 
This chapter does, though, deal with only one subject. In all of the verses, Paul deals with one subject, and that is resurrection. He speaks, first of all, of the resurrection of Jesus, and then he talks about our resurrection one day, one day that you and I will rise from the dead just as Jesus did because he is the first fruits of those who have slept. And although this chapter was written almost 2,000 years ago, this chapter proves that the resurrection of Jesus is significant for us today. So this morning, here's what I want to try to do. Not sure whether I'll do a good job, but I want to try to connect the dots, all right? I want to try to connect the dots so that, so that you and I not only walk away saying, okay, Jesus rose from the dead, but I want to understand how that applies to me and how that applies to you this morning. If you're here today, and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, please do not misunderstand my statement. I'm not asking whether you're a member of our church or whether you're a member of any church. If you're here today and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, my prayer is that through these verses, you will see how life-changing, how eternity-changing Jesus can be for you. And if you're already a follower of Jesus. Let me remind you today how important, how relevant his resurrection is for us. So if you're following along in your outline, I'm going to go quickly. If you're following along in your outline, the very first thing that we wrote down is this. The resurrection makes life worth living. Now, now you might have came this morning just sitting back saying, okay, the resurrection is something we celebrate once a year, and we kind of tie that in with the Easter bunny and all kinds of chocolate, all right? But, but let me assure you today that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just a historical event that we celebrate once a year. The resurrection of Jesus makes life worth living. Uh, the simple truth is this, that the resurrection shouldn't just change our future but it changes our present as well. Uh, salvation doesn't just give us a get out of jail pass or to use biblical terms, a get out of hell pass where we die and all of a sudden we hold up, hey, look what I got, I got a get out of hell pass, all right? The resurrection doesn't just give us a get out of hell pass, it actually gives us a live life to the fullest card. It actually gives us a card and ability for us to live our lives to the fullest, as Jesus says, to live it more abundantly. So I want, us to see, I want you to see two phrases that we read already in the first few verses. The first is found in verse 1 where Paul says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Now, the gospel is not a term that we use very often. As a matter of fact, if you have a more modern translation, Paul might say, let me remind you of the good news. Because the word gospel simply means good news. In verse 2, out of the New Living Translation, I'm not sure what translation you have, the New Living Translation says this, it is the good news that saves you. It is the gospel that saves you. As I mentioned, the word gospel means good tidings, glad tidings, good news. The word is found 108 times in the New Testament. This is an important word. And as you read through the New Testament, you'll see this word used repeatedly. So here's a couple of things. How does the resurrection give good news to us? If you're following along in your notes, is this. The resurrection is good news in a world filled with bad news. Do you get what I'm saying this morning? Do you ever get tired of hearing bad news? Do you ever, are there ever nights when you turn on the TV to watch the news and you're like, you know what, I just don't think I can handle it today, <laughs> all right? I just don't want to hear any more bad news. The world is filled with bad news. A German pilot intentionally crashes an airplane filled with 150 innocent victims. Islamic terrorists kill 147 students in a Kenyan university. Racial tensions still exist in our country. Uh, bad news. Uh, I was reading the other day that milk is not as healthy for you as my mom told me when I was growing up. 
I mean, I walk away. My mom used to tell me, man, Brian, drink, drink as much milk as you can. That's healthy for you. And now they're telling me that it's not as healthy as my mom said it was when I was growing up. Life is filled with bad news. And, and, and listen, in the midst of bad news, I don't know whether you're like me, in the midst of bad news, I love hearing good news. Our, our staff comes in on a regular basis and says, uh, Brian, I got to tell you something. And, and they'll verify, I'll ask the question right up front, is this good news or bad news? All right? I mean, don't, don't keep me in suspense. I want to know if this is good or this is bad. And so some of them come in right away and say, hey, Brian, I got good news, just because they know because I'm kind of paranoid and I'm just so used to hearing bad news. Well, in a world filled with bad news, the gospel is good news. Imagine turning on your television today and hearing the announcer say, breaking news, your sin debt is paid in full. Breaking news, you are no longer alone. God is with you. Breaking news, all power is available to you. That addiction that has you down, you do not have to be controlled by that addiction. God gives you the power to overcome it. That's good news. Breaking news. Don't worry about death. Breaking news. God says that he will provide for all of your needs. Now listen, church, those aren't things that I made up today. Those just aren't the words of a preacher who's trying his best to be eloquent. Those are promises that God gives us in the gospel. They are a wonderful part of the good news of salvation. So the gospel is good news in a world filled with bad news. Here's the second thing that I wrote down, and this will resonate with you. The gospel, um, secondly, makes right that which sin makes wrong. Do you, you, you ever watch something? Uh, I'm sure you do, because I see it every week. You see somebody do something to someone, or you watch something on TV, and your response is, oh, man, that's just plain wrong. Do you, you, you ever watch something happen, and you sit back and say, man, that's just wrong whether it's somebody being abused or somebody being mistreated or whatever it is. Well, listen, the gospel, the gospel is beginning to make right that which sin makes wrong. Uh, Paul said this in verse 3. He, he, he makes this simple phrase, and he says it in such a simple way. And yet this is one of the most profound statements. In verse 3, he says this, Christ died for our sins. Would you read that with me today? I want us to say that together as a congregation, all right? Just a simple phrase. Christ died for our sins. Would you say that with me again one more time? Christ died for our sins. On Friday, I asked the question, how many sins have you committed in your life? And we actually did the math trying to figure out how many sins I have committed. Um, I'm not sure whether we recorded it so you can watch it later on, but I guess that if I commit five sins a day for 365 days a year, I'm 52 and a half years old, that I have committed more than 95,000 sins. I mentioned on Friday, some of you were here, that Vicky and I were sitting at the table talking about it over breakfast. And I said, Vicky, you know what? I did the math. I think I've committed over 95,000 sins. She looked at me and she said, you've committed a lot more than that, Brian. <laughs> I think she said that I've committed 95,000 just in the 30 years that we've been married. I think she's actually keeping a record of all of them. Listen, here's what Paul says. Christ died for our sins. How many of them? All of them. You sit back today and you say, well, Brian, you have no idea what I've done. I don't, but he does. 
You said, Brian, I would be absolutely ashamed if people knew some of the sins that I have committed. Be assured of the fact that there is a God in heaven who knows what sins you have committed, still loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to what? To die for your sins. And part of that process of restoring us to a right relationship with him is beginning to fix that which is wrong in our lives. He desires to take that which is wrong, that which we have been wronged, and he desires to make it right. That's what the gospel does. As many of you know, we we fully support, I'm so proud, if I can use that word. Sometimes I use that word and people send me a text or a tweet say, Brian, you're not allowed to be proud. And so I am, I am righteously proud in saying that we fully support a women's crisis center in Burkina Faso, in Yako, Burkina Faso. Our missionaries, Mike and Amy Rittering, Mike and Amy Rittering are there and with the orphanage and the Christian school and all of the things that they do, This last year, we opened up a women's crisis center for women who have been abused and mistreated. Yesterday, out of the blue, didn't even ask for it, yesterday, out of the blue, Mike sent me pictures and testimonies of some of the ladies whose lives are being changed by the power of the gospel. Can I introduce you to two of them? The lady on the left is Marietta. At the age of 15, Marietta's mother circumcised her. If you don't know what that is, it's genital mutilation. I know it's graphic. Her mother did that to her, botched it completely. Three years later, tried to do it all over again. Marietta fled from her house. She refused to do it. As a result, she was rejected by her family and had to leave. 18 years old, she had to leave. In the last couple of months, Marietta was brought to the Women's Crisis Center there in Yako, Burkina Faso, where all of a sudden this lady who was an outcast, who was rejected and abused by her family in a culture in which women are already at the bottom rung of the culture, and those who are kicked out of their families are even lower than that, and all of a sudden Marietta comes to the Women's Crisis Center, begins to hear about Jesus, and hears how her life can be dramatically changed. Marietta today is learning to sew. She's learning to become a tailor, which is one of the best jobs in Burkina Faso. On Friday, she's learning how to make soap and how to weave baskets. Here's what Mike told me about her. He said, Brian, we're looking for medical care. We're not sure whether we can help her or not, but we're looking for medical care. But God knew exactly what she needed, and he sent her to us. Mike said, Brian, just three days ago, they don't force the gospel on these people. Three days ago, she came to me and said, Pastor Mike, can I have a Bible? I want a Bible on my own, of my own. Mike says, Brian, God's at work in Marietta's life. <laughs> Sally Mata, you, know, you can't see Sally Mata. She only has one arm. She only has a right arm. You said, Brian, what happened to her left arm? Her husband cut off her left arm with a machete. She fled. Where did she flee to? She fled to the Women's Crisis Center in Yako, Burkina Faso. There she's found hope, she's found Jesus, and she's found a brand new life. We're gonna be putting their testimonies up on our website in the next few days. Here's what I want you to catch, and and they actually sent me 11 different pictures with 11 different stories of 11 different ladies whose lives are being changed by what? What is changing their life? Is it Mike and Amy? Mike and Amy have a great part in it. If you know Mike and Amy, they got a heart about this big, but it's not Mike and Amy that's changing Marietta's life. It's not Mike and Amy that's changing, changing Sally Mata's life. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is changing their lives and is, that it, and is giving them hope. So this morning, let me ask you, thankfully, you're not in Marietta's situation, nor are you in Selimata's situation, but what is it that you need this morning? Sit back and think about that for a second. What is it that you need this morning? Are you struggling with an addiction this morning? 
Maybe it's a dependency addiction. Maybe it's an alcohol addiction. Who knows? Maybe it's a shopping addiction. Can I get some husbands that would say amen to that? I don't know. I thought somebody. (laughs) Are you struggling with an addiction today? The resurrection of Jesus Christ can free you from that. Do you have an anger problem in your life? Jesus overcame that when he rose from the dead. Do you have major relationship struggles? You might sit back and say, Brian, you have no idea what it's like in our house. You have no idea what my relationship is like with my spouse or with my kids. I don't, but God does. And the gospel has a solution for that. Because when Jesus came and died on the cross and rose from the dead, he came for the purpose of making right that which sin makes wrong. Jesus has the solution for your life and mine. It is the power of the resurrection that makes life worth living. We sang just a few moments ago, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. Life is worth the living. Why? Because he lives. And so, and so the resurrection helps us to make life worth living. Let me show you a second thing that Paul brings out in this chapter. The resurrection makes religion relevant. The resurrection makes religion relevant. If you have your Bibles, jump down to verse 14. We're gonna jump jump down just a little ways. Verse 14, Paul makes this statement. He said, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. You know as well as I do that in recent years, organized religion has been under attack. Many churches are decreasing in attendance. Spiritual leaders are are no longer given the respect that they once had. I speak with people all the time that use this phrase, hey Brian, you know what, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. I I just don't need the church. There was even a YouTube video that recently went viral highlighting why one man said that he hates religion, but he loves Jesus. I get it. I get it. I get that there's been inconsistencies and hypocrisies. I get all of that. Religion does not provide what we need. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, you're a pastor. I can't believe you're saying that. Let me say it again. Religion does not provide what we need. Jesus did not call us to be religious. As a matter of fact, I say frequently the word religion is found five times in the New Testament. Three out of the five times it's used not positively, it's used negatively, speaking of hypocritical religious people. I get it. Religion divides, but catch me, Jesus unites. Religion judges, but Jesus accepts. Religion gives rules, but Jesus gives grace. Religion gives us hypocrisy, but Jesus gives us holiness. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not disparaging religion this morning. I'm simply saying that any religion, any church without Jesus without the message of the resurrection, offers us nothing of real value. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives relevance to religion. Tim Keller, who's the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, make this statement. I love it. I'll put it up on the screen. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any 
of what he said. That's a great thought. Did you ever think about that? As you read through the Bible, you sit back and say, is this relevant for me? Well, the question is this. It's not, do you like that or don't like that? The question is this, did he rise from the dead? Because if he rose from the dead, then everything he said is relevant. If he didn't rise from the dead, then let's just lay it aside because it has no bearing on our life is what Tim Keller is saying. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but it's whether or not he rose from the dead. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in verses 14 through 17. He actually gives a series of negative statements that indicate a positive truth. Basically what he does is he gives us an alternative ending. He gives us a second reality saying, okay, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, here is the reality. Notice verse 14 once again. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Here's what I wrote down to say it real practical, okay? Without the resurrection, our faith is empty. Without the resurrection, our faith is empty. Let me ask you, anybody here like to grill? I love to grill. Vicki and I grill often. like to grill steaks, like to grill hamburgers, like to grill chicken breasts. I'm I'm pretty much of a master at grilling chicken breasts, aren't I, Uh, Vicki? I love to grill, but there's nothing that aggravates me more than Vicki will say, okay, just about everything's ready, Brian. It's time to go out. And, and cook those chicken breasts. And I go out and try to flip on the grill, and what? The tank's empty. That ever happened to you? The, the, the tank is empty, and you don't have a spare tank, because when the spare tank emptied, you forgot to take it to the store and get another one. So you have what? All of dinner is ready except for the meat, and there's nothing in the tank. All right, you could have five tanks out there, but if those tanks are empty, they're what? They're useless. They're worth absolutely nothing. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying about the resurrection. He says, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, if he did not do what he professed he was going to do and then claimed that he did afterward, if that did not happen, then our faith is empty. He uses the word useless in our text. It literally means fruitless, pointless, or empty. The idea being that any religion, any conviction, any creed, any faith, any of those things are empty without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the resurrection, catch this, that fills your tank. It is the resurrection that gives life meaning. It's the resurrection that makes everything worthwhile. Here's the second thing that Paul says. Paul says, without the resurrection, the gospel is a lie. Well, those are pretty strong words. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel is a lie. Verse 14, he says, and we apostles would all be lying about God. You see, if the resurrection did not really happen, then Matthew, John, Peter, all those people we look to as not only historical figures, but leaders of the church, they would all be liars. They would be a part of the greatest hoax in the history of the world. I love the the words of Charles Coulson. Some of you might be too young to remember Charles Coulson. Remember Charles Coulson was involved in the whole Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon. Remember that? Some of us remember that. Chuck Coulson, while he was in prison serving his time, became a believer. And Chuck Coulson made this statement. He said this. I'll put it up on the screen. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. Some of them were killed. They would not have endured that if it wasn't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. They couldn't keep alive for three weeks. 
You're telling me the 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. What is Chuck Colson saying? Chuck Colson is saying, if the resurrection is not true, then we're all liars. We're living out the greatest hoax in the history of the world. He makes a third statement. He said, without the resurrection, everyone is condemned. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And he makes this statement, you are still guilty in your sins. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, all of us would be eternally guilty before God. No hope, no life, no future, no escape if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Man, if you're reading that, you get down to verse 19 and you think, man, this seems bleak. But then you come to verse 20. And verse 20 is like a shining neon light in the midst of a dark world because Paul says this in verse 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Paul says, back to reality. Let's leave that alternate reality and back to reality. The reality is that Jesus did die. The reality is that Jesus was buried. And the reality is that three days later, he did rise from the dead. All of those suppositions are untrue. Here's what Paul says, religion is not irrelevant. It's not a waste of time. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus make what we do each and every Sunday relevant. It gives it purpose. As a matter of fact, if you ask Brian, why do we meet together on the first day of the week? What is it about Sunday that that prompts us as believers to come together on Sunday because it was on the first day of the week that Jesus rose from the dead. And we come together every single Sunday celebrating what? That we serve a risen Savior and that he is in the world today. You see, the resurrection makes religion relevant. Uh, Let me show you a third thing as we begin to draw to a close. The third thing is this. The resurrection makes heaven real. The resurrection makes heaven real. Let me read you verses 18 and 19. I'll put them up on the screen. You follow along. He said, Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He's back to that second reality. He says, If Jesus didn't die on the cross for us and and, and was buried and rose again, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have already gone on ahead, who are believers that already died, then they have perished. And then he makes this statement in verse 19, which is a strong statement. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, he says, we are of all people to be most pitied. What what in the world is... Paul's saying, let me give you two things in your outline and we'll we'll flesh it out for just a second. He says this, the resurrection of Jesus gives assurance that we will see our believing loved ones again. The resurrection gives assurance that we'll see our believing loved ones again. As a pastor, I, I, I have the privilege of standing with families at some of the most joyous and some of the most difficult moments of their life. As I've done recently, I was at the hospital with several of our families as they brought a new child into the world. I love doing that. I stand right here at times with couples as, they, as that bride walks down the aisle and that, and that husband or that groom walks over and grabs his future wife's hand. And I'm able to stand here and participate with them in that intimate moment. Sometimes I almost have to turn away and blush because it's such an intimate moment between that husband and wife. I stand with families beside the casket of their loved one as the funeral director looks at them and says, it's time to shut the casket. And their hearts are broken. I have the privilege of doing that. 
And yet I also am able to look at them and say, there is hope. There is hope that you will see this loved one again. Hey, as Arnold Schwarzenegger says, it's not goodbye, it's just hasta luego, baby, hasta la vista, baby. Is that what he says? Uh, you didn't know Arnold Schwarzenegger was so theological, did you? Hey, for the believers, we believe, we know, we have hope that we'll see that loved one again. That's the gist of this entire chapter. I'd encourage you to go home today at some time, read all 58 verses of, of chapter 15, because the argument that the apostle Paul is making is a future argument. He's saying, you know what? We have hope that we're going to see those loved ones again. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. He is the first fruits of those. He is the first one that was buried and rose again. And he says, you know what? We are going to follow in his footsteps. We have hope. I love, um, I love, uh, as, as, as many of you know, we were missionaries in Mexico for 10 years, and, and um, there was something different about the funerals that we did um, in Mexico. First of all, they would have to, they'd have to bury within 24 hours, and so the person would die, and we'd almost immediately go to the funeral home, and we'd pass the evening in the funeral home, and then in the morning, we would go to graveside. And I remember the first time that I experienced the funeral of a, of a Mexican believer, I was so moved because at times we stand beside the graveside and we cry and I get all of that. Grieving is a normal process. But man, as we stood beside the graveside of those Mexican believers, they stood around as family and they began singing hymns. Cuando la trompeta suena en aquel día final. When the coming of the Lord Shall, or, or when the Lord shall come and time shall be no more, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I never experienced such hope in my life as I stood arm in arm with those believers as they sang and they expressed hope at the graveside of their loved one that they will see them again. What was it that gave them hope? It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying. And Paul says that the resurrection gives us assurance that we will live again. Verse 19, he says, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Here's what Paul is saying. If we as believers come together and we cheer and we do all of that and we celebrate the resurrection, but there's nothing, if life ends, we're annihilated at the end, if there's no hope after this life, Paul says, man, we are to be pitied. We're not to be made fun of. We're to be pitied by everyone else because we're hoping in something that is not true. But the argument that Paul makes is, that simply is not the case. The case is that we have hope. We know we're going to see our loved ones again. We know that we are going to live again. Why? Because Jesus is alive. He makes several conclusions. Life is tempor temporary. This is not all there is. And here's what he's saying. Heaven is better than this. Heaven is better than this. That's how we need to live. The last thing Paul says is this, and I'm done. He ends the chapter making this statement. He says, the resurrection of Jesus makes our victory certain. It's funny, twice we sang, I'm not sure whether you caught it, but two songs that we sang had the verses that we're ending with. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56, 57, and 58, where Paul says this, O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But then he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what Paul is saying. In Christ, we have victory. What do you need victory over today? Come on, be honest. What do you need victory over today? You see, in Jesus Christ, our bitterness is converted into blessing. 
In Jesus, our disappointment is converted into delight. In Jesus, our hopelessness is transformed into hope. In Jesus, our fears become faith. In Jesus, sin is defeated by the Savior. And in Jesus, death is overcome by life. In Jesus, we pass from death to life. So, so can I ask you today? Have you passed from death to life? Has there been a time in your life in which you have been spiritually resuscitated by the Holy Spirit of God as he comes into your life by faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been made alive? Or this morning, are you still living in the shadow of death? Are you living in the light of life? The simple truth is this. God wants to change your life and he can change your life as a matter of fact you are surrounded by people today who have passed from death to life who were spiritually dead and have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior that's what God offers us not death he offers us life in Jesus 